Sir, it's um, 2 p.m. now. Shall we? Uh, shall I start the program? Kitesh? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, can we start, ma'am? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, Momita, please start from your side. A very good afternoon and warm welcome to all the committees present here. I am Momita from Kerala. Certified Allocated Station Assistant to ensure a seamless experience. Kerala stands as India's most relied upon digital platform offering a multitude of enriching services exclusively for doctors. It is with great pride that Kerala serves as the digital partner for this event hosted by the All India Institute of Medical Sciences partner and the focus of today's session is sample size made easy. So let's begin to the session for which I would like to invite Dr. Pragya Kumar ma'am to take over further. Over to you ma'am. Thank you Momita and thank you Team Clernet. So uh, in association with the Association of Community Medicine of Ames Patna and Clernet and Merit India, we are uh, starting with this uh, first uh, webinar on sample size calculation made easy. And today's topic is the cross-sectional study design. So uh, we'll start uh, the session and in between, if any questions are there, you can post over the Zoom chat and we will try to answer the questions at the end of the webinar. Probably, I hope that at the end of the webinar, many of you might get your answers. If you don't get, then we will answer all the query at the end. So let's imagine a study and today's topic is a cross-sectional study. So we'll start with this uh, hypothetical study that uh, if I want to know the vitamin D deficiency in school age children, how should I proceed? So my research question is the prevalence of vitamin D in school going children. So what I did, I have selected the thousand children aged six to 12 years from five schools. And I have measured the blood sample I have taken the blood sample and measured vitamin D in those kids. And again, I have collected the information like the sun exposure, their dietary habits, their physical activity. And then I have concluded that low vitamin D level is associated with the limited sun exposure. So what did I do in this study? So I have selected the sample, which is the children from a population which was the school and then what I did I measured the vitamin D level in those kids and then I determined the association between the two and this all is happening at the same time point. So we'll discuss of this point which is the same time point. This sample, although in my case it was children, but it could be any sample. So sample can be a hospital record. If I am doing a record-based study, it can be a X-ray plate if I am doing something where my study subjects or the study unit is the X-ray plate. In case of pathology department or microbiology department or biochemistry, it can be a pathological specimen. So not necessarily this study unit is not always a person. It depends from the department to department. So the study unit or the population can be a X-ray plate or a pathological specimen or blood sample or any other record. So similarly, I have selected these samples from a bigger population. So the how I have collected data in this study. So basically, there are four options. You can see all these four options. And please type in the chat box, what did I do? In that school where I measured the vitamin D level and measured the association, what did I do? Yes? I'm expecting answers from you people. So Payal is writing B. Okay, any other response apart from Payal? Jayati, Yashovardhan, Merlin, Piyush, Saranya, yes. All of you are perfectly right that it is we are collecting the exposure and outcome data at the same time point. Now, the next question is, 
there is a frame, there's a uh, like phrase, same point in time. So what does this same point in time mean in context of a cross-sectional study? Because many times we see residents and PGs in confusion, when do we call a study as a cross-sectional study? So like there are four options, data on out outcome are collected before any exposures are measured, both exposure and outcome data are collected simultaneously, data collection occurs over multiple time periods to observe changes, exposures are recorded first followed by outcome. So answer, most of you are writing B, that both we are collecting simultaneously in a single time point. Now, yes, you uh, all are right. But I'll tell you a few examples. Many times I have seen researcher thinking, because I will recruit one individual today, and then I will recruit the other individual tomorrow. So if I have to recruit, let's say 100 people, it might take three months for me to recruit all those 100 people. But the study duration of three months doesn't say that it's a prospective study because I am going ahead of time. So I have seen, maybe it is my experience, many times researchers, especially the clinicians, they think that if I am collecting data for a period of six months, then it is a cohort study. It is a follow-up study. So it is not so because you cannot recruit individual in a single day. It takes time. So the whole crux lies, you are measuring in the measurement of the exposure and outcome. And in this case, this same time point means it can be like uh, in a very short span of time. Like I, in thesis also, you will see like if you have collected the, uh, collected the data today, you might call the patient for the sample tomorrow or the, if the patient could not give sample today, the sample will be collected tomorrow. So this doesn't mean that it is a cohort study or this is a prospective study since you, you could not get the sample today and you are collecting the sample tomorrow, that doesn't mean that it is a prospective study. So again, short span means like in a limited time period, it, it will be less than a week. And you are collecting both the exposure and the outcome in the single time frame or period. So that we mean by the same point in time. Now, how does this same point in time aspect affect the ability of a cross-sectional study to determine causality? Because you know that whenever we say that X is causal for Y, then there is a concept which is known as the causality. There are many criteria to assess that causality. And one of the criteria here, it is like uh, we can talk about like how in which type of study it can be done. So answer like RSRI is saying C and D. So C is it limits the ability to establish causality because it only captures associations. Yes, true. And it requires repeated measurement to observe temporal changes. So that temporal changes, it is something related to probably the follow-up study. When you have some outcome and you want to see the outcome over the time, how it is, it is getting changed. So yes, that will give you the causality because if you have started with exposure and the outcome still has not happened, so you can determine the causality. But cross-sectional study, true that it cannot, you cannot establish causality because you are assessing both the exposure and outcome at the same time point. You don't know. In case of a children also, you don't know for how long their, uh, whether they have shifted or this exposure to sunlight. What is the definition of your exposure to sunlight? Is it in the last week, last month or based on residence where they are located? So depending on those things, you have to decide and in case of a cross-sectional study, it is difficult to decide about the causality. So what is the advantage then? Why should we do the cross-sectional study? If uh, causality, which is one of the very important criteria uh, to see the cause and effect relationship, then why should we do it? So because it is quick uh, in doing and it can be done in a short span of time. So especially it is suited, suited for a thesis topic or a any study 
where you want some quick result within three months, six months or a year, then it quickly assess the prevalence or it quickly assess the association and the potential risk factor. And then based on that study, you can plan a bigger study seeing the result. Because if you see the uh, hierarchy of the uh, research evidence, then this cross-sectional study is at the bottom and then comes the case control and then cohort and then randomized control trial. So it is, you can say, it is the uh, initial step of proving an association and with this, you can plan a bigger study to prove the causality and many more other uh, epidemiological relevance. So the now next question is, can cross-sectional study this prevalence study be conducted in hospital setting? This is also a very important question which you will experience in any of the IEC or the uh, research committee presentation, especially the clinician. Whenever they say that prevalence of XXX in hospital, many times you will see that people from the community medicine or the epidemiologist, they raise uh, that you know prevalence is a word which generally we should use only in the community setting. But that is not true. So you are right that yes, it is commonly conducted to assess the prevalence of disease in a hospital. Definitely, it has got some limitations and we'll see what are those limitations. So if you are doing a prevalence-based cross-sectional study, so what, what are the limitations of, uh, I mean, what is the limitation, the major limitation? Yes, one participant is writing proportion. Yes, that can you can say that it is a proportion, but even if you use the word prevalence, and generally you will see people writing hospital-based prevalence. So they are not wrong. That is again right. Yes, proportion, if you are saying that is also correct, but even if somebody is writing prevalence, they are not wrong. So the answer is, uh, the issue is about the generalizability because the... Uh, in a hospital, especially in a tertiary care center, like let's say the example of AIMS, here the patient comes from the West Bengal, the bordering districts of Bihar, the Jharkhand, and probably uh, so the uh, the other bordering states people also come. Uh, so you cannot always say that uh, the result is generalizable to the whole Bihar or maybe some uh, no districts around it. So uh, there is an issue of generalizability, definitely. So, but again, it gives you initial evidence of the risk factor. Now, uh, imagine you are conducting a cross-sectional study on the prevalence of obesity and uh, you want to know the association of this obesity with the physical activity. And your hypothesis is that a lower physical activity is associated with the higher rate of obesity. So, what you have done, you have... Uh, like draw a random sample of X number of adults from a city and then you are measuring the outcome and outcome you have set a criteria that those people where the BMI is more than 30, you will call them as a obese. And uh, this exposure you have ascertained based on the self-reported levels of physical activity and you have categorized that as a low or high. So what is the hypothesis in this case? So the null hypothesis in this case is that there is no association between the physical activity level and obesity prevalence. Now coming to the concept, I will be discussing little bit about the uh, importance of the sample size calculation. Because many times you will see we randomly take a number. Let's say 100 is a favorite number of most of us. So either we take 100 or 150 or any, any random number. So just look into this table. So if I am going to see this first row, so what can you see here? Here you can see there are six columns, the uh, seven column rather. So the first column, it tells you regarding the number of adults. So if I am focusing now on this, so what can you see here? That there are 20 adults which I have selected. 10 are having low physical activity and 10 are having the uh, high or good physical activity. So out of 10, there are four individuals who are obese. So 40% are obese who are, who uh, we can say that uh, who are doing the less physical activity, 40% are obese 
and here this percentage is 20%. Now in the second row, if you see, I have increased the number of adults which I have taken. So I have taken like 50 and then you see here also it is 40% and the 20%. Again, I have increased the sample to 100 and you see that this proportion is same in the prevalence of this uh, if I, I am seeing the physical activity and obesity, so same proportion of obese are uh, there across the category of all the sample size. So if I ask this question, like which is the result which you think has the highest probability uh, and which has the lowest probability occurring by chance? So if I take as a chance factor, so I'll be concluding that people who are less physically active they, the, the proportion of obesity is twice as compared to the uh, people who are very active. So what is the uh, role of chance factor? It, it is there in which of the row? Row number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Which, is, which you can say that there is a least probability of it by happening by chance and highest probability of giving this result by chance. Yes? So I, I cannot see the answer. Okay, so one Augustina Sarvana, fifth lowest. Yes, true. Since the sample size is there as a thousand, so you can see that role of chance factor is least in case of a fifth row and it is highest. Yes, B. Natarajan has uh, written or uh, R.S. is also correct that one has got the highest probability of occurring this event by chance and the fifth has a lowest probability of occurring this event by chance. So you can see that as you increase the number of subjects, your certainty changed from no to maybe to yes. And that's the role of sample size. So now coming to the... Uh, why to calculate a sample size? So generally we calculate sample size to tell about the population estimate. We, you have got a population or a, uh, you know, about which you want to do some pred prediction or you want to say something. So you select a sample from that population and you make predictions about that population. So that's why you are collecting a sample because you cannot take every one from the population. And that's why you should be able to generalize your finding. That's why you want to have a correct number of sample and correct way of choosing that sample, which is the sampling method. So if your sample size is very small, like we have seen in the first case, the first row where it was only 10. So even if what happens that that has got a very less Power. power we will understand later, but that even if there is a clinically significant difference, that study will declare that the there was no difference. So clinically significant difference, that particular study will conclude as there is no difference. And again, if the sample size is very large, because you can say that I'll take everyone from the whatever I have, but what will happen if your sample size is very large, then there are two problems. The first problem is that it will be a wastage of resources and time. And if it is a randomized control trial, then of, of course you are subjecting the individual to the various hazards or maybe the risk of intervention. But even if it is a cross-sectional study when you are only observing, then we say something which is known as the power hacking. Power hacking means the power of the study will be so high that it will detect a clinically insignificant result as a statistically very highly significant. Like p-value will be, you know, 0 0.00001. So then you will conclude that it is very, very, very significant, although the clinical significance of that study is not that much. And that's why there, there is a role of, we call it as an effect size, which we are not discussing in this session. But that's why you will say that these days, we are uh, more into reporting the effect size rather than the uh, p-value or the statistical significance. 
So that's the issue. That's why we need a balanced sample size means we call as a adequate sample size. It should not be very small in number and it should not be too large also. And again, there is a one more problem with the large sample size, which we call as a law of diminishing returns. Because if you are thinking that by increasing your sample size, you will gain more, then there comes a point where even if you increase your sample, you are not getting that particular, even the statistical benefit. After some time point, there is a, like you can say, plateau in the p-value. That statistical significance doesn't increase that much, which is known as the law of diminishing return. And that's why you say that you should have a adequate sample size and not too small or too large. So we have discussed that we cannot decide and we should not decide this number arbitrarily. Now coming to few concepts. So like that's why we call something known as the level of significance. So generally we will discuss this concept later also. But we say that there are two levels of uncertainty. First is the level of significance. So level of significance we preset. Like generally we set it at level of 5%. And we are saying that we are ready to take a risk of 5% by of alpha error. So now what is alpha error? Generally it is said that if you are rejecting a null hypothesis, when actually it was true, that means there was no association because what this alpha, this uh, uh, null hypothesis says that there is no association, but you have concluded that there is an association. So that chance you are only taking, fixing as, as 5%. And second, you are getting from the data set. So the p-value which you get from the data set, it indicates that, you know, what result you are getting. So like, let's say, if the value of P is 0 0.04, it says that there are 4% chance of rejecting the null hypothesis when it was true. So whenever you are calculated P value is less than your fixed value, you reject the null hypothesis and you conclude that there is a statistically significant association. Now coming to the confidence level. What is this confidence level? So confidence level says, because I said like there are two terms in sample, whatever you measure, we call it as statistics and you pop in population, whatever you measure, that is called as the parameter. So through sample statistics, you want to predict about the population parameter because you don't know the real value. So the, if you say that, you know, uh, uh, confidence is like, let's say 90% or 95% or 99%, what does it mean? So if we say that 95% confidence level, that means if we repeat the study 100 times, 95% of the calculated intervals of those study will contain the true parameter. That we mean by the confidence level. That means we are 95% confident that the calculated interval will contain the true parameter. So this we mean by the nine, uh, confidence level. There are various values of confidence level like 90%, 95%, 99%. But generally we keep it as 95%. We don't even increase it to 99% because if you increase your confidence value, your precision will reduce. Because And if you reduce the confidence level like 90%, so your precision will uh, be too much. Uh, I mean, it will be less. So it, it goes vice versa. That's why 95% is the ideal one. Because if you increase the confidence level, that means the curve will be more spread. And curve will be more spread means your precision will be less. Why? Because the values will be lying apart. So your precision will be less. So that's why you want to make a balance between the 99% and 90%. And that's why you have kept it as 95% confidence level. And that's why you will say in every sample size calculation, we set this confidence level at 95%. Now coming to the concept of generalizability. Because what we said, 
we calculate the sample estimate and we want to generalize this for the population from where we have taken. So in any study, we want our sample to be representative so that our study finding can be utilized by the policy maker. Because what ultimately happens that we want that our studies should yield something which should help the clinicians or epidemiologist or policy maker to adopt policy or to make guideline. So if our study is not generalizable, our study will not be fitting into those criteria. So how to make our study generalizable? So like for example, if I want to know the proportion of diabetic patients having diabetic retinopathy, so what should I do? Should I select whole population of diabetic patients or should I be selecting a sample? So generally we select a sample. But again, if the whole population is very less, then you can have everyone in your study. But usually we don't carry a study on the whole population. So what we do, we, you select. So you select a representative portion from that population and this representative portion is known as the sample. Now this is, sub, let's say this is a population the green color represents the male and the orange color represents the female. So if I select these male and female from that population in a manner which like the best is a simple random sampling which the method of sampling we are not discussing. But if we are selecting something as a uh, simple random sampling or which is equivalent to simple random sampling and then we, we can say that it is generalizable to the whole population. So we have to generalize our finding only for the population from where we have selected the sample. We will see this with the help of few examples. Like if I have, I am doing any study from the MBBS batch 2020 of AIMS Delhi, my study will be generalized to that population only because I have not taken the students for from any other batches like 21, 22, 23. So my study will not be generalizable to the other batch and to even other medical colleges. And if I, I have to study something and I want to generalize something for whole of the 2020 batch, then I have to take the whole of the medical colleges then only I can say that it is of Delhi only because Delhi word means you have to take sample from the all of the medical college which are there in the Delhi. Similarly, if I am taking diabetic cases from a hospital, then I can generalize my finding to that hospital. And if I am taking a pathological specimen from that hospital, then again, there are few things like if you say that that is the only hospital in that area. You will see many studies when they say that this hospital was the only catering hospital and most of the people in that population were going to that hospital. If your case is something like that, then you can say that that is generalizable to the whole population. But generally, that is not the case. Generally, people, there are multiple health center in an area. So that's why people go to multiple places. So your Sample is not the representation of the entire district or the entire block. So now coming to this uh, steps in the sample. So now uh, coming to the topic per se. Till now we were having a little background information uh, of this uh, steps in sample size. Okay, so before we go, I can see Deep Shikha and Nitin raising their hands. Okay, do you want to ask something? Deep, Deep Shikha and Nitin, you can uh, type in the chat box before we move further to the sample size calculation. Plus one, some other has drained the hand. Okay, Deep Shikha, I think they are not responding. Okay, so I will go ahead since I cannot see any other answer. No, okay. So now coming to the steps in the sample size calculation. So the first step in the sample size calculation is the you, you are seeing your uh, study research question and you have set your objective. 
So based on your ob objective, you have to identify the major study variables and the type of the variable. The second is you have to do the thorough literature review and you have to select one study which is very much similar to your study, the study which you have planned. That that's we call is a as a reference study, and then from that reference study you identify the parameters for the calculation of sample size. This step is the most crucial step, and often we have seen residents or the PGs having difficulty in selecting the parameters from the uh, this overall sample. So, uh, Kiruthika is asking, generalizability and external validity are the same. Yes, there are two validity, internal validity and the external validity. And external validity is, yes, you are right, generalizability is, it, more or less it is similar to the external validity. That means you can project that finding, that finding is valid for any other person who is there in the population. So yes, uh, again, I'll start. So identification of that parameter for that sample size calculation, that is the most crucial step, especially if you see when your assessment is a quantitative, because for quantitative or the continuous assessment, you need standard deviation. And standard deviation is generally, you see that that is there hidden in the table. Many times, the author, they don't report it in the description. So you have to read that study twice or thrice to have a feel like what are the different parameters. And once you understand the parameter, then the calculation of sample size is a very simple step. It doesn't take much of the effort because we have got online calculator and software. You just put those input into the software and you will get a uh, sample size calculation. So we'll see how to identify also those things from a table. And then you enter that into a software or an online calculator and you calculate the sample size. After the calculation, again, if any adjustment is required in your sample size, ca size calculation, you do the adjustment and then you do the final write-up. Because many times you will see that, uh, you know, resident, they are having difficulty in writing. How to write up that particular section of the calculation of sample size. So usually residents who are there from our department, they will seek their help in making a write up how to write the sample size. So like I said that you have to first identify your research question and what is the type of variable. So just to have a quick recap, I know all of you know this, but since many of you might be attending these webinars or maybe a first year PG for whom these concepts are not clear. So I'm sorry for those who will find it as a repetition, but bear with us. So this, uh, you can see uh, a variable section here. So there are various variables like you can see here as a pain status, the first variable, then uh, the uh, we are measuring this as in the form of a VAR score. And we have categorized this as a mild, moderate and severe. Then coming to this obesity, if I am measuring this obesity as a BMI, then what is this? This is a quantitative measurement, which is a mean. But if I am categorizing this as obese, obesity present and obesity absent, then I am categorizing this as a categorical variable or the proportion. If I am measuring the vitamin D status, and I have measured the serum vitamin D level. So the absolute value of that serum vitamin D will be measured as mean. But if I'm classifying that based on cutoff as normal or deficit, then I am converting this continuous variable into a categorical variable. So for continuous variable, we use mean and for categorical variable, we use proportion. Similar is the case of marks. If we are taking absolute marks like 60%, 70%, it will be as a mean marks. Or, and if we are categorizing it as pass or fail or first division or distinction, non-distinction, then it is a categorical variable or a proportion. 
So in the next few slides, you have to type in the chat box that what is the type of variable, whether it is a mean or proportion. Because if you identify these two things from your research question and objective, you are half done. So that's why it is very essential. So if the study variable is gender, so what will be your answer? Only proportion possible, only mean possible, or both possible? Yes, only proportion because you cannot decide for a mean for a gender. Blood loss, well, if my outcome variable is blood loss, Okay, Nitin is writing one. Okay, that is, uh, okay, two. Sorry, Nitin, you have correctly answered. For blood loss, uh, two or three. So most of people are, few are answering one or so. So we are seeing all three type of, so blood loss generally, how can you decide? Like let's say 500 ml, ml. So mean is possible. But if you classify this as maybe PPH, present PPH absent based on the blood loss, or maybe if you categorize this, like 500 is too much loss, less than 500 or 200 to 500. So yes, you can write like Soham is writing, both is both are possible. Mean also or proportional and proportion also, right. Now coming to the blood group, what will be your answer? Only proportion possible, only mean both. Yes, only proportion because you cannot have a mean for blood group. So there are few variables which are inherently qualitative in nature, like gender, like blood group. There are few variables which are inherently quantitative in nature. And you can change the quantitative variable into the categories. So that's why many times we ask our PGs, if you don't check what they do, they make the category since beginning and then they collect the data. But we always advise, please collect the continuous data. Later, you can make as many category depending upon your cutoff. So you should, in, if you see the order of data, the continuous data orders higher rank as compared to nominal data. So continuous data should be always collected as a continuous. This variable, oxygen saturation, Yes, what will be your answer? Three, both possible. True, because you can have a 95%, 96% or you can like based on that hyp uh, hypoxia, less than 95 or less than 90. True. So in these example, what have you observed? That in case of a categorical variable, only proportion is possible. And in case of a continuous variable, both mean and proportion is possible. Now coming to review of literature. So this is also one problem. PGs come to, us, come to us for the calculation of sample size and to our resident also, they will also support my statement that many times they don't find the exact size. Ideally, you should try to find a search which is very much similar to your study. So that is one thing. If your study, if you, you are unable to find something, then you can do because your department also collects data so you can do a pilot study on 15 to 20 cases before you go for the, your presentation. And from that pilot, pilot study, you can decide about your outcome. What is the proportion? You can use that proportion for the calculation of sample size for your study. If both the things are not possible, then you can decide based on your experience, on your means, on your guide's experience because they are every day doing the clinical work and seeing the patients. So if there is some best guess which is possible, you can also quote. But generally, if you see the uh, IRC, that is the research committee, and the uh, they generally don't uh, go by this uh, best guess. So generally, they ask for some reference. So you should try to find near similar experience or some pilot study very much similar to your research question. This will give you the output which you have to enter, like outcome, your values. Now you have to set the parameters for output, this uh, testing. So generally I said that 
this we have discussed earlier also about the null hypothesis and about your study hypothesis. So if like in this case, if I say that mortality due to COVID is higher in males, and if my null hypothesis says that there is no difference and if I accept this, the result in these two quadrant, this is the right decision. If the null hypothesis is false and I reject this, this will not lead to any problem. If null hypothesis is true and I accept that, there is no problem. But the problem happens when the null hypothesis is false and you, you, you say that null hypothesis, you accept this, means you reject the null hypothesis. And the other type of problem happens when you say that the null hypothesis was, uh, you reject it when it was actually true. So the here, when the null hypothesis say, but you reject this null hypothesis, your study reject this. This is known as the type one error, which is also known as the false positive error. And this type two error is also known as the false negative error. So no, most commonly, even if you don't remember what is this type one and type two error, remember that you fix the type one error in five at, at least at 5%. You will not increase this error to more than 5%. Either it should be set at 5% or 1%. Similarly, type two also you fix. That means you will calculate a sample size where you don't expect that your power, because this type two error is like power of the study. What do I mean by power? 100 minus beta is the power of study. That means ability to detect that difference is the power. Generally, it is done in the hypothesis testing. So, ability to detect that difference between the two groups, if it is less, then your study will be underpowered. So, that's why you fix this as 20%. That means the minimum power of the study should be 80%. It can be 80%, 85, 90, 95, but at least 80%. So these two, you fix it prior to calculation of the sample size. And then you calculate the sample size either using the formula manually, which is seldom done by us. We generally used mobile, use the online calculator or software like G Power is one software. But in G Power, there is a problem that uh, People who are uh, like not from the epidemiology background or who are not very well versed with all sort of statistical tests because it uses two concepts, G power. It takes the type of analysis also into the consideration and it works mainly on the effect size. So unless and until you are very sure of your concepts or effect size, it is difficult for you to understand G power. That's why initially we plan to do this webinar webinar on GPAR. But then we thought that we'll have a workshop on GPAR because we were not sure that uh, all of you who are going to attend it, whether something will go to your head because you know, it is uh, a little more statistical in concept than GPAR. So that's why we have stricted, uh, restricted ourselves to the risk scale, which we'll see today, and the statulator, which we have earlier also we have uh, like uh, done the webinar using statulator and then there are online calculator also so we'll use this online calculator and then we do the adjustment if needed so adjustment is needed if you have got a finite population that means you have got a reference population where you have got those many number of sample you can do the finite population correction we'll see the example of these specific cases of adjustment if your study design involves the cluster sampling, then there is a concept of design effect. And this design effect also we'll see how to apply, how to calculate the design effect. And then this response rate, this is commonly done because generally you don't expect everyone to be responsive for your uh, you know, data or for your performer. So you said that there will be few people who will not be uh, like they, they will not, they will refuse that or they will not come to you. So that is known as the response rate. Generally, we keep the response rate as 80% or 90%, but it is up to the researcher discretion how much response rate they want to have. And we make some adjustment of that response rate. So these three adjustments, finite population correction, 
design, putting the design effect and the response rate. So uh, this finite population, by default, this sample size calculation that is done for the infinite population. That means we don't have a sampling frame. But when you have got a sampling frame, that means you know that uh, uh, in particular year, you expect only th uh, 300 people to come for your research. Then that predefined sampling frame is available. In that case, you can apply this finite population correction. And generally, if you use, use the finite population correction, it reduces the sample size. So many times in our PG thesis, uh, our PGs, they apply this uh, finite population correction and that helps to helps them to reduce the sample size also. Because uh, if in the limited time frame, it is not possible because a PG thesis is only for like, you can say two years and the data collection period is one year. So in one year, if they don't have that much, uh, you know, possibility to collect. So they give a frame that in one year, they expect these many people to come and then they correct using that sampling frame. So this reduces their sample size. But if the sampling, but if your sample frame has got only 100 subjects, then there is no point doing the population correction and you should take everyone who is there in the sample uh, if we are estimating a single proportion. Coming to response rate, generally I said that response rate is the non-availability of samples or participants or records in your study and we can assume it from a range of 5% to 20%. But again, it is up to you. You can have 20% uh, also and you can have uh, as low as 5% uh, also. Coming to design effect, whenever, now in design effect, there is a concept which is known as the clustering. So I'll speak a few lines on this clustering. What is this clustering? So basically, whenever clustering is a naturally occurring unit, like family, if there are in the family of six people, we expect that they will share some similar characteristics, some genetic, some behavioral, some environmental. So at any level, if the group is sharing some common characteristics, then we can call it as a cluster. The cluster can be a hospital, it can be a department, it can be a school, it can be a village, or it can be any unit in which the subjects, they are represented as a group. Normally, if you are doing a large survey from a population, so you cannot use the simple random technique, which is very difficult and that is not feasible. So what we do, we do the cluster sampling. So we identify people in groups, like let's say village, that can act as a cluster. So we select individual from every village uh, as a, the, where they belong to. Now, design effect is also affected by the intra-class correlation coefficient. Now, what is this design effect? Generally, wherever there is a clustering, that means they are sharing some common characteristics, then your variability inside that cluster is very less. And this sample size depends on variability. So if the variability is less, then you will have to take more sample to prove your hypothesis. And this design effect is affected by something known as the intra-class correlation coefficient, which is known as the ICC. So as the word suggests, you can see there are three words, intra, class, and correlation. Intra-class means inside a cluster. And correlation, you say that it is a measure of association between two. So if it, 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 its value ranges from 0 to 1. And this ICC value tells us how member from a given cluster correlates. If the value of ICC is high, that means members correlate very well with each other. That means there is a less of variability and more of homogeneity. And this, info, this correlation lead to decrease information capture. Because then it, it means that even if you take everyone from that cluster, 
it will be like taking one or two individual from that cluster because they are all same. So that's why a high ICC, if there is a high ICC, you have to take more clusters and your sample size will also increase. That's why you have to put the design effect. So this is, you can set the ICC using this table. This is the degree of homogeneity. So degree of homogeneity is high if your ICC is point more than equal to 0.2. Now there is a uh, formula of this design effect. This design effect is calculated using the formula 1 plus m minus 1 into rho. This m is the number of individual per cluster. Like let's say in a, in a village, if there are 1000 people living, so that number of uh, that cluster size here, m will be your 1000. And this rho is the value of ICC. So either it is calculated, either it is assumed or it is gained from the previous literature. Generally, you will not find very uh, this uh, uh, ICC very commonly from the previous literature. So we assume it. So uh, generally we assume, you can assume it from 0 0.01 to 0 0.05, but we assume it at 0 0.02. So we will see this uh, sample size in the research, it is primarily determined by which objective? This is one question. Primary objective, secondary objective, study design, statistical analysis plan. So yes, right, primary objective. True. Because many times you will see that uh, people, they will come with their secondary objective and they ask that which objective should be used. True. All of you are right. So primary objective is generally, it should be the guiding objective for the calculation of sample size. So I am not, I am skipping this part, the difference between the primary and secondary objective. I hope you all know this. Now there is one more question. If I have many uh, multiple primary objectives, what should I do? Generally, you should have one objective, but if you have got more than one objective, then you calculate sample size using both the objective and then the larger sample size, the objective, which gives you the large sample, larger sample size, you will accept that sample size. Now coming to the uh, calculation per se. Okay, so this is, uh, these are the four scenario which we will use. Single proportion. So in single proportion formula, you should have expected proportion, the confidence level and the precision. And at, uh, this in case of a single mean, as I said, you should have expected standard deviation, confidence level and precision. If it, your study is an analytical cross-sectional study where you are comparing two proportion, then uh, it your assumption should have proportion difference or odds ratio, you should have alpha value and a par. And then if you are comparing two means, then again, you should have a mean difference and a standard deviation, the alpha level and the par. And for all these, you will do the adjustment for the finite population correction, design effect and response rate, wherever it is required. So coming to the sample size calculation for estimate, of estimation of a single proportion in cross-sectional study. So this formula given by Cochrane, we use this formula for the calculation of sample size for single proportion. This is the Z square P in the bracket, it is one minus P and in the denominator, it is the D. So this Z is the value of Z at assumed level of confidence. The confidence which we have assumed is the 95%. And the value of Z at 95% is 1.96. And therefore, you will see many times they take it, take this 1.96 as 2 and they write it as 4 P Q by L square. So this is again same 1 minus P is the Q. This P is a proportion and this D is the assumed percentage for the margin of error. So this is the margin of error, which is also known as the precision. Because if the margin of error is high, the precision will be low. If the margin of error is low, your precision will be high. So what input do I need for single proportion? So I need to enter the level of confidence, expected proportion, margin of error, 
And if I want, this, these are the must, these three things. Confidence level, expected proportion, and margin of error. This population size, design effect, and response rate, you may or you may not. Coming to the precision, absolute versus relative. So there are two types of precision, or you can say there are two types of margin of error. We will understand this with one example. So this is the concept of absolute versus relative. You can see there is a milk chocolate here. So if the cost of this milk chocolate in 2020 was 20 rupees and in 2021 it is 15 rupees. So what we will say that absolute cost reduction will be of 5 rupees. But if I have to cal calculate the relative cost reduction, then I have to use a reference point, which was the initial one. So I will say that there is a 25% reduction in the cost of the amul chocolate. Same concept we apply in case of a precision. In case of a uh, margin of error, if we take 3% or 2%, then we, like, uh, for example, in this case, if I say the prevalence of diabetes is 20% in this population, and I have fixed it with a 3% of absolute margin of error, what will I say? 20% plus minus 3%. That means the population parameter, that means the population prevalence of diabetes will be from 17% to the 23%. This is the absolute margin of error. Means you will reduce 3% from 20 and you will add 3% to 20. So it will be 17% to 23%. If I, the same I have to express it as a relative, what I will do? I will take 3% of 20. In this case, if you see, if the prevalence of diabetes is 20% in this population with 20% relative precision, so relative precision means you will take the relative margin of error means you will take this margin of error of the proportion. So this depends on the proportion. So 20% means 20% of 20%. So it will be 4%, this relative precision. That means you expect your population parameter to lie between the 16% to 24%. So again, to reiterate, Absolute margin of error, you just add the value towards the lesser side and towards the larger side. In case of a relative precision, you have to take the relative of that proportion which is there. This is the percentage. Okay, so Arashree is writing the uh, uh, absolute uh, revision. Yeah. So, Arashri, I was telling you the absolute precision or the margin of error. So, generally you see the, okay, wrinkle has also not understand this. I will repeat this once again. Let's say, uh, you will understand this more in case of sample size calculation also. But absolute margin of error means that you are not taking this as a reference of any other proportion. If I say that uh, my absolute margin of error is 3% here in this case, first, what is what do you understand by margin of error? Basically, like I said, that why do you calc why are you taking the sample? So basically, we take the sample so that we can have a population estimate because the real estimate is not known. Suppose in our Let's say this population, I am taking this 20% population as a medical student. So I'm saying that 20% of the medical student is having the diabetes. And maybe I have done the study using the uh, proper sampling method and sample size. So now my value comes as the, if, if, if I want to take that study, now again, I want to repeat my study, this study in the medical student. So I have taken the previous literature, that is the 20%, and I have fixed the margin of error. Means, in my case, I expect that in my population, this value will be somewhat from 17% to 23%. Because you, can, you have to take a margin of error. That we call it as a confidence interval. Means, I have said that the true population mean will lie from 17, in my case, from 17% to 
to the 23%, I can accept that much error. You can further reduce this. If you want it as 1%, then you will say, no, I don't want to give that big range. So I will calculate sample size, which will say that my true population mean um, a percentage will lie from 19% to 21%. If I have fixed it as 1%, but the lesser margin of error you fix, larger will be the sample size. We will see this when we will actually calculate this. So the more precise you want to be, more precise means you don't want your study interval to lie very far apart. Because if I say that if you study, you can get marks from 30% to 90%. Will you accept this. No, you will not because you will say 30% is too low and 90% is too high. So that high, if you are predicting, it will not come to into application because you are not being precise. But if I say that if you study for 10 hours, you will get a marks from 70% to 90% and your mean marks will be 80%. Then you will be happy. Okay, at least the least I will get is the 70%. So that is known as the margin of error. Means any intervention or any calculation which you are calculating, you want to predict your population parameter. So that real you cannot be so sure. So what you do, you accept some margin of error. So there are two types of margin of error. One is the absolute and the other is the relative. Generally, we will see if the prevalence is less than 10%, then you select for the, yes, oh, that, that's what I'm coming to. Like uh, Pangham has write, writing, ma'am, how do we decide whether to use absolute margin of error or relative of margin? Yes, true, rightly said. For a, what is the uh, good point about the absolute margin of error? For absolute, you don't have to calculate. You directly have to interpret. But if your prevalence, any prevalence, if it is less than 10%, you will see this. We have given you scenario where you have to calculate sample size. If prevalence of any disorder is less than 10%, you should use the relative precision. Because if you use the, use the absolute, it will be very less. Means the confidence interval will be very wide. We will show you with this example. And if the prevalence is more than 10%, you can use the absolute precision. If the prevalence is 15%, you can use 2%. That means 13 to 17%. That much error or that much margin of error you accept it. But if your prevalence is, let's say, 2%, it is a very rare, rare disorder. I, I guess there was, a, uh, uh, there was a proposal from ophthalmology department uh, where uh, what they were cal calculating uh, some some proportion of some genetic disorder yeah they yeah. came to us and the prevalence was very low i think it was like some 1.6 percent amblyopia yes they they made some proposal for grant where the prevalence was 1.6 percent so if the prevalence is 1.6 percent and absolute error if you apply it as one percent so it will be very wide 0. 0.6 to 2.2 so in that case, you should use relative precision. Means like if I use the relative precision of 10%, it will be 10% of 1.6. That will be, it will be 0.16. Are you getting me? So if the prevalence is very low, generally you should use the relative precision. But if you want to have it as a rule, if you, you use a relative precision, generally you are always right. Because relative precision... Like up till, you know, up till 50 or 60%. Higher than that, again, it will have a more of error. So as a rule, you remember, if the prevalence is very low, less than 10%, you should take a relative precision into account. If prevalence of any disorder is between 10 to 50%, you should take absolute precision into account. You will have, a, did you get something out of it? Okay, thank you. Uh, we will have more uh, exercises on this relative precision and absolute precision. Then you will clearly understand what is the scenario. 
So now uh, let's do the calculations. So this is, you are seeing time. Sorry. So this is a research question uh, that uh, I want to measure the patient satisfaction level regarding various healthcare services at urban health center in XYZ city. So my primary objective is to determine the proportion of patients satisfied with the healthcare services provided at an urban healthcare center in this city. And I have to focus on overall satisfaction, such as time spent with doctors, technical quality and accessibility. So uh, let, let's see the reference article. So if you scan this QR code, are they getting the study? So all of you, please scan this QR code. You will see the reference study. And then you can see how to select for that parameter. So since I have this article, I am waiting for some time for all of you to scan this. Could anybody get the article? Okay, Dr. Pradhan has said yes. Okay, then I can move ahead. So if I go to this reference article, if you see this, okay. This is the abstract. This is a cross-sectional study on patient satisfaction in urban healthcare center of Siliguri Municipal Corporation, Darjeeling. And in the abstract, I have just highlighted this, that the overall satisfaction was 73% with a mean value of 3.65, right? So this parameter I have taken into my uh, calculation. So the what assumptions I have set? I have set the expected proportion as 73.5%. That, that was the level of satisfaction. And I am doing this study in my setup. So remember, I am doing this study in my setup. That's why I have used this as a reference article. I, I will set the ref, uh, confidence level at 95%. And since this is a higher proportion, I will use the absolute margin of error. That means I expect my uh, population, this thing, to be from, if you minus the 73, may say 5, it will be 68. So from 68% to 78%. So my true population value will lie in between these two boundaries. From 68, that means 73 plus 5 and 73 minus 5. So 68 to 78. That, that is the range. So now I will do the calculation. So I will use two, uh, I will show you with the two online calculator. So it is 73%. So this, I will use the calculator. So let's say where is the... So this is the statulator. And statulator, you can see if you type this statulator.com, this, uh, this will come. Yes, Senthil is writing 73%, right? So I will, if you like, just this is see the drop down menu. You can see there are many options. Single proportion, two independent proportion, compared pair proportion. If you take mean, it is estimation of a mean, comparing two independent means and comparing the paired differences. So coming to the single proportion. So I click this as a single proportion and then what value I will enter? 73%. So what will be the value of 73? The level of confidence, if you like put it here, it is also it also writes what does this mean by level of confidence. So it gives you the write-up. 
In the expected proportion, if you see this 50%, I have to make it because it was 73%. So it I will increase it to 0 0.7. This will be 0 0.71, 0 0.72 and 0 0.73. So this is 73% and the margin of error. If you see this, you can see there are two options. There is absolute value and there is a relative to expected proportion. So if I'm using the expected proportion, this margin of error as a 5%, then this is there and if you I press calculate it gives you the sample size. So sample size in this case is 303 which I have calculated if you see this this is the this was Okay. So you can see this. This is 69. So this even more than before that. This was 303. This much I have calculated. And then the same value you can see from the statulator because I have calculated from the statulator only. Now, if I have to use the risk scale, I said you that this is a risk scale, which is the developed by the Cleveland. And here you can go by the section means the type of study wise. If you see the interface, many students, they want the sample size calculation based study wise. Like here you will see they have given the criteria like randomized trial, observational study, and then cross sectional study and survey. So I have clicked survey because this is a single proportion. And then you can see type one error rate, that is the 5%. This I have fixed and they calculate it from the type one error rate. There you will see in statulator, it is the confidence level. Here they have used the type one error rate. Expected proportion here, the, uh, the good part is you can type. So it is like 60%, you can type it as 0.73. And absolute, but there is a problem that here you will not have an option of relative precision. In case of uh, this risk scale, they have only given the option of absolute error. So in this case, my absolute absolute error is 5%. So it is the 0 0.05. So if I calculate sample size, you will see the sample size is 303. So you can see it gives you approximately the same sample size. The good part in case of a risk scale is you can have exact value. You, we will see later. But in statulator, if you see this, statulator, there's a drag option is there. But again, if you come to adjustment, so we'll see the, now the next question. You have seen this. Now, how to do the write-up? So this template is there for with you. You can do the write-up taking help of these templates. So what is the write-up? I have written that to determine the necessary sample size for the study on patient satisfaction. I have taken a reference of a previous study, which is the Chakravarti et al. And I will give a citation. The expected proportion of the patient satisfaction from this prior study was 73.1%. We chose a 95% confidence level and 5% margin of error. And with these parameters, the calculated sample size required for our study came to be 303 patients. That was the number of samples, number of sample. But if I have to do the adjustment, like response rate, how to do that adjustment of response rate? So if I am expecting that response rate is, is, will be 80%, what I'll do, I will divide this sample size by 0.8. So this will be approximately 380. Now this option, if you see, that is there in the statulator. If you, if you see the statulator, this is the interface and I'll come to adjustment. This is the option of adjust. If I click this adjust, you can see there are three types of adjustment. 
there is an adjustment for finite population. There is an adjustment for clustering. And there is an adjustment for response rate. So currently, if I want to click for this adjustment for response rate, I will click this and you can set this. So for my study, the response rate is 80%. So I'll make it as 0 0.80 and I'll update it. Once I update it, you can see the updated is 379. But this option of like adjustment is not there in risk scale. So Rinki is writing how to know that we have to do the adjustment. So it depends on your sample. Generally, whenever you approach a patient, not everyone will be willing to be a part of your study. So they say that they don't want to be a part of your study. So then you say that you will contact those many individuals. Means you will contact 20% extra. That means if your sample size is 303, you will contact 380 so that you will get 303 people in your sample. That's the meaning of the response rate or the adjustment. So one thing is like generally you see that, but again, there is a point of clinician that they say that I will take 303 whomsoever comes. So then they don't go by this response rate. They say that I will take who is willing to be a part of my study. So final, I will take 303. They don't give the number of uh, people whom they contact. And generally, this adjustment is done for the follow-up study. Means like you are doing some randomized control trial or some observational study like cohort study where you are following the patient for like three visits. So if you don't account for this follow-up uh, like response rate that means the patient has come to you for the first follow-up but he did not come for the second and third then that is a loss to follow up that's why you have you take this as 20 percent non-response or loss to follow up and then you include it in your sample size so uh, drop rate yes it is similar to drop rate you can say khati is asking can we increase it by 10 yes yes it is up to you. You can have it as a 5% also. And you can say that uh, you will not because you will take, uh, you if you expect that much high or if you have ways to include everyone, then you can say that I have not included this, the non-response. So I will only take who is responsive. So I have taken everyone. So that also can be done. Now coming to the other adjustment. So we will see, we have seen, yes. Khyati is right. Generally, we don't take up till, in many studies, even I have seen 30% also. If it is a long study follow-up, like for one and a half year, like in an orthopedic department, there were people who are like, uh, you know, knee replacement surgery. So generally, they they ha I have seen taking them up, up till 30% also. So the, it depends on the follow-up duration. If the duration is high, but yes, you sh in your study design, you should have some some ways to reduce this loss to follow. Like uh, that's why you go multiple times, you do phone calls, and then you try to find out the reason for no loss to follow. And then you analyze those reasons also separately. So there are statistical ways to analyze that. We are not discussing that. But generally, this is set as 10, 5 to 10%, 20% also it is there. It is, it is the researcher discretion, depending on his or her experience. So this uh, we have seen uh, as a 380. So write-up will be again the same it is there. If you just see the blue highlighted one, we have added that anticipated response rate of 80%. We have included, we will uh, include the 380 patients. So now it's for you to practice. So all of those of you who are seeing this on phone, you can also do it over phone, the statulator. The, the research question for you people is, what is the prevalence of premenstrual syndrome among female students at this university? And you have to estimate the prevalence of PMS and how it impacts on their academics. Okay, so uh, Pang, uh, this uh, Pangabam is saying that uh, what percentage can be used, the response rate, so that the power of the study is not affected. Actually, in case of a survey, generally we don't talk about power. 
power is only when you take two mean or two proportion when it is an analytical or hypothesis testing then we talk about the power but yes you say that generally you should the the, the loss to follow up should not be more than 20 percent and if it is there you include more people and many times what you do you calculate power after the calculation of the values also uh, so that you you could say that yes your study was not under powered even if let's say you have anticipated that there will be 20 percent loss to follow but you don't know if the follow-up loss is 30 percent then what you do you again calculate power generally you calculate power a priori means you have fixed it at 80 percent but if there are more loss to follow up then Many times you calculate, recalculate power from your study. And then you show that if your power is more than 80%, that means your study is not under power. But here in this case, we are doing a cross-sectional study where there is a single parameter. And this is a basically it is a descriptive one or where there is a survey. So in that case, we don't talk about power. In this case, it is more of a response rate. I hope. I'm able to make myself clear to you. Uh, yes, so all of you, please uh, scan. Yes, are you saying something? Oh, yes. So I'll show. You can see this. Uh, uh, you can scan this. I'll show you the assumption. So this is the expected proportion. If you can scan those uh, th that article, you will see that expected proportion reported by the Tolesa et al. is 37%. And you have to calculate it at the level of confidence 95% and margin of error 5%. So all of you, please calculate that. Although I have written it. And if you see, yes, 359. If I go to the reference article. I am getting the answer. Okay, that's good. That you are getting. Yes, you can see this. Generally, the, these prevalence, you can see it is there in the abstract. So here, if you see this abstract, here I have just highlighted the prevalence, that the prevalence is 37%. You can see 37%. And this finding I have taken. Yes, so all of you are correct. It is 359. So now, this will be the write-up that the expected proportion of, oh, by mistake, we have written patient satisfaction. It is the uh, premenstrual syndrome from the prior study was 37%. So we have chosen 95% confidence level and 5% margin of error. And the total sample is 359. So now suppose there are 600 girls in this university. So will this affect the final sample size calculation? If there are 600 girls in this XYZ, Okay, so Niranjan is, Natrajan is writing no. But would you like to do a finite population correction? Because you have got a finite population here. You are calculating this in a, in, in a university. So all of you, please, uh, I will tell you how to do that finite population correction. It will reduce the sample size. Yeah, so I, I'll just show. So what it was, the this was 37%. So I'll show you. I am opening this statue later. So this was 37%. So I'll make it as 0.37. And this is the 5%. If I do the calculate, so this is here the response rate. I, I have already clicked. I have just removed this. So the just it is 359. Now, if I have to do the adjustment, I will do it for finite population correction. So here I'll do it for 600. If I do it for 600 and update, my sample size will come down to 225. So yes, if you do a finite population correction, then you do the 
finite population correction. But generally, it is done if it is less than 1000. If your population frame is more than 1000, then generally, uh, generally we don't do this. Now, coming to the another assumption. So, this is formula for adjustment. It can be rewritten as n is the your, this adjusted sample size, this is capital N is your finite population and n small n is your sample size which you have calculated. So, you can do it manually if you are using the risk scale because in risk scale, you don't have an option of the population cor correction or the adjustment. So, final calculated sample size is 225. And this is again write up. You can add this last line in the initial lines that after adjusting for the finite population correction of 600 students, the final calculated sample size was 225 participants. So this was the one adjustment. So now let's do some calculation with the relative precision as you people asked. So this is one research question. What is the prevalence of diabetic foot ulcers among diabetic patients in urban hospital? And how does this prevalence vary with age? So my primary objective is to estimate the prevalence of diabetic foot ulcer among diabetic patients. So if you see the reference article, the pre expected proportion in um, like I have taken the reference from this Zhang et al. And if you see this article, if I see this reference article, So this is the article which I have taken, Global Epidemiology of Diabetic Foot Ulceration. So here he has given a meta-analysis. So the now next question is, can I take a estimate from a meta-analysis? Yes, of course. You can quote a study of meta-analysis also. So he has found out that the global diabetic ulcer foot prevalence was 6.3% and I'm taking this as a value. So 20% here, it is the relative precision. So you will see that. Yes, it is... Maximum, you can take it up to 20% and the 20% of relative. So 20% of relative, all of you calculate 6, it will be 20% of 6.3. So it is the relative margin of error. So like you can see, I have calculated a, a margin of error. How much will be the margin of error? So 20% of 6.3, it will be 0.01. You can see the value will be 0 0.012. So the final calculated sample size will be 1430. So I'll just do this. You can also do this if I go by this. So it is 6.3 percent. We'll use this. Yes. So this is 95%. This I'll take it as point. This 0.63 means 0 0.06. This is there and here I will take at absolute. Not absolute as a relative. And relative 20% means 0.2. And then calculate. So you can see it is 1500, some 1505. But if you take absolute value as 0 0.0126, if you see in the slide, my absolute value is 0 0.0126. So you can use this in the Cleveland, that, that formula. So I'll again go to the another type, which is the risk scale this one and here in the absolute precision here i will use point zero six point zero six three because it was and here i will use at point zero zero one what was the value point zero one two point zero one two and six point three yes zero one two six so the utility of this is like you can type exact value, which is not there with you. So now you, if you calculate the sample size, it will be like 1429. 
So one participant has asked Muhammad Gotke, do we use absolute precision to reduce sample size as compared to relative precision? No, generally we don't. It depends on researcher, how much precise population parameter he wants. So many times it happens, like in PG thesis, if the duration is small, and you know that thesis has to be submitted within a stipulated period of time. Then at times we, you know, we increase the margin of error, but we don't go beyond 5%. But if the proportion is very high and if we can't do, then what we do, we calculate the sample size show, showing all the margin of error. So what we do here, we calculate the sample size at 3%, at 5% and 7%. And then we show that they, there is a three possibility. But if my study period is less, then I accept that seeing the feasibility of the study, I may accept 7% as a margin of error. But in that case, your prevalence should be some way, you know, 50% or more than 50%. If the prevalence is very less, 16%, 15%, uh, 16 then your margin of error cannot be 7%. So that's why... Uh, you say it. And yes, definitely in relative precision, the margin of error uh, is less. So your sample size is more if you calculate the relative precision, if you take the relative precision. But yes, even if you take a small value of absolute precision, the calculated sample size comes higher if you take 2%. Ultimately, it is the expression. Relative precision also, you can express it as an absolute precision. Like I, I, I did here, this margin of error, you are actually calculating it as an absolute precision. So 0 0.0126 is an absolute precision, which you are calculating through relative because 20% saying relative is very much acceptable. But if you say like 0 0.0126, someone might ask on basis of what you have calculated absolute precision like this. So that's why we take relative precision if the prevalence is less. Like less than 10% or so, then you should go for the relative precision. So this is the write-up that uh, to determine the necessary sample size for a study, we, we have referred this and the prevalence was 6.3%. So this was the 1430 cases. Now, time for you to practice. So this is a research question, the prevalence of primary biliary cholangitis among adults in XYZ and how does this condition impact the liver function test? So yes, you can scan to see the reference article. I will give you a few seconds and then I'll show you the input values also. So in this case, the author have reported the prevalence of primary biliary cholangitis as 22 case per 1 lakh population. So you can, can convert this as percentage and then percentage will be 0 0.022. Again, this is a low proportion. So you will have a margin of error as a relative and this 20% you can calculate it. So if I do it, I'll go with this statulator. In, then again, in statulator, you, you cannot use exact 0 0.022. So, uh, Kritika, specific condition for this uh, population adjustment is only like if you want to decrease the sample size and if you have got a finite population number, then you can use this finite population correction. It is up to you. If you don't want to use it, then definitely the sample size will be higher. So it is always good. But many times what we suggest to our PG student that if there is a finite number of people, I'll tell you one thing. Many times what happens, like there was a study going on here and we, we have to finish that study in three years. But the calculated sample size was very huge. And we thought that we will not expect those many patients because at that time, Ames was a new hospital. So we will not get those many patients in three years. And again, there was one more thing. Uh, I think in pediatric surgery also, there was a, a thesis on the um, umbilical hernia. Na? 
yeah some uh, some case of uh, hernia repair so we were not expecting those many hernia umbilical hernia of pediatric cases in the 3 year period so in that case you have to do the population correction means you expect based on the prior experience that you will have only these many patients and then you can divide it i mean do the adjustment and that will help you in getting a sample size which is feasible during this 3 year is it okay so it is generally recommended so if i show you this 1022 so you have to go by this so here it is the 0 0.022 and if you see the relative precision it is 0 0.044 if i take as a 20 percent so calculated sample size is 4270 because if you see the absolute it is here 4270 you can do the same thing with statulata, but again, you can only 3890, I think. Because why it is less? Because yours will be 0 0.2 only. You cannot set it as 0 0.22, 0 0.022. That cannot be done in the statulator. That's why. But that is also okay. It is not, I'm not saying that that will be wrong. If you do it in statulator, so I will go with this. So, I will reset this. What was the value? Point zero two two, no? Point point zero two. So I will it will be point zero two two. So this will be like up till this. And relative precision, I have this thing, and this I have made it as point two. So, if you calculate this, 4706, this will be the value. So, now coming to the, okay, so the, uh, 30 minutes, no. So, I think we can continue this next time. The same because it will, it is not, yeah, what, what do you want? Like, the timing of webinar is like, uh, it's 90 minutes. Uh, next webinar is on, we planned it to be a case control study, but we could not finish a lot of, uh, like discussion is still left. So are you people ready to stay for 30 more minutes or should we do it next time? Clarnet and uh, the participants. Uh, ma'am, it can be extended, ma'am. No issues from our end. Okay. What about participants? Should we continue? Okay. Okay. So we will continue. In the meantime, if, if someone wants to like leave, that is okay. You people can. So let's do the calculation for the design effect. So now coming to the concept of design effect, this is one um, research question. So now you will see that I have to identify whether the design effect will be applicable in my case or not. So the research question is the prevalence. What is the prevalence of early childhood caries among primary school children in this city and how do the socio-demographic factors affect this prevalence. So this primary objective is to estimate the prevalence of early childhood caries among primary school children. If I see the reference article, you can scan the reference article from this uh, QR code or I will go to this reference article and if I see the values, the prevalence of this early childhood caries, it was 53.6%. So now seeing this 53.6%, yes, yes, I think it will be shared to you. The recording and PPT, both will be shared to you, Palla. So in this case, what is the sampling unit? So if you expect that children within the same school, so it is a school. So remember what we talked about the clustering effect. So students or children or people sharing some same unit or some characteristics. It is known as the cluster. And generally they are naturally occurring. So school is considered as a cluster. So that's why they are similar to each other in context of a socio-demographic or environmental factor. And this needs to be factored whenever we calculate our sample size. 
because this affects the variance and basically this whole sample size calculation it it depends on the variance and the uh, ultimately it shows the precision of our estimate so that's why like in this example uh, you can see this country so sujal is asking while selecting the study area whether the country or place matter yes definitely in the title also or in research question you have to if you are taking the place then the sampling you have to do adequately or appropriately so study area it matters definitely the place matters i mean the reference okay so reference generally you take the reference from it depends first you see whether it is related to your area or not so if like if i am doing study in bihar i'll try to look up for a reference which is from bihar if i don't find a reference from bihar i look up a similar study in the eastern india if i don't find a reference in eastern india i'll go in india if i don't find a study of india then i'll go in the southeast asian region if i don't find a study in southeast asian then i can take uh, you know global so that's the way we go in the hierarchy so this uh, uh, just see this picture you can see there are two rows one and two so where you can find uh, like more of homogeneity in which case one or two yes so you can see in one all of our same colors so that's we mean by homogeneity or clustering so clustering effect is more in school 1 and clustering effect is less in school 2 so remember we talked about the value of icc intra class correlation coefficient that means the correlation is high so in which case the value of rho or icc will be high first case or second case so intra class will be high in first case because correlation is very high in the first case in the second case it will have a lesser value as compared to the first case so that's why you see that icc value will be high in the first case so if the icc value is high in the first case you can see that this will affect your sample size and your sample size will be larger why because everyone will be similar so there is no the variability will be less so if the variability will be less you need to take more sample to prove your hypothesis so that's why you will see in the formula for calculation of design effect also in the calculation of design effect this design effect basically it adjusts the sample size on account of increase in the variance that arises from study design especially when the data are not collected through simple random so in case there will be high intra class correlation and you can see that the formula for calculation of design effect is 1 plus m minus 1 into icc so this icc is the intra class correlation coefficient generally it is not available so you take this value as 0.02 if you can find it from a previous study that is okay if you not if you are unable to find you assume this to be a 0.02 that is the optimum so it measures the degree of correlation within a cluster if no prior data on icc available you can have a conservative estimate from 01 to 05 and this is the reference we have looked up for this reference and this is the reference from where we took this so the calculation of design effect how will you will calculate suppose the total number of available schools and this happened with one of our projects also uh, the total number of available school was 60 and uh, selected school how we selected 20 because minimum number of cluster is should be 10 it should not be less than that and the average size of the children of those schools were 2200 
So how I have calculated the design effect? So design effect you can see as here, I have calculated is as five. So how will I put that into my calculation? So here you can see the expected proportion as reported by this Faria et al was 53%. The level of confidence was 95%. The margin of error was 5%. Why? Because I have taken a larger proportion. So I have used the absolute margin of error. And this design effect is not assumed. This is calculated. So I have calculated the design effect as 5. Now let's do the calculation. Again, if you see this, you can do this better in Statulator because Statulator gives you the adjustment of this design effect and ICC. So I'll go to this Statulator. I'll, res I'll reset this. Otherwise, it might take the prior values. So it is 95%. It was 0.53%. So I'll make it as 0.53%. Absolute precision was 5% and then I'll adjust it. So in adjustment, I'll go for the clustering. So you can choose the intra-class correlation coefficient. So if I use this, then you can directly put your value. I have used like 0 0.02 and cluster size, I have taken it as a 20 because I want to take the, uh, no, it is 200 because 200 is the average number of students in each school. And then I have updated this. So my calculated sample size, if I see this calculate, it will be the 1907. If I use the formula of design effect, then you can directly go for this 5. And you can update this. So it will also give you the 1914. So depending on your choice, you can directly go for ICC and number of cluster because that formula is there in the statulator. So you don't need to calculate the design effect. It is 1914. Now we have not given any um, like exercise for you people, but you can just see this and you can try doing this on your own. Now coming, we have talked. So till now we have talked about the sample size calculation in single proportion. So let's talk about the sample size calculation to compare two proportions. So if it is an analytical cross-sectional study, you have got a comparison group. So you have got two proportion, one in your reference population and other is your study population. So this is the background formula which is used in the calculator. Don't get like nervous by seeing this formula. You don't have to do anything. I have just shown you that you should write this whenever you put your calculation. If you write this, that means the RAC or the research committee, they'll come to know that you know the formula. So it is basically Z1 minus alpha by 2. Under root, you can see it is P, P bar. That is the average, means average of proportion, which I have written here. This P is your P1 plus P2 by 2. And then you take again Z beta and like this is the formula. So that's why you have to, you should write this formula. Now what input do we need for comparing two proportions? So we calculate the proportion, expected proportion in group one the expected proportion or odds ratio. So here comes the concept of odds ratio and then desired power also. So desired power is usually we have discussed this, that we keep this desired power at 80%. The level of significance, we keep it as 5%. And depending on the hypothesis, whether it is a one-sided or a two-sided hypothesis, generally we keep it as a two-sided hypothesis. So these inputs are must. And then you may do like group sizes. So here comes the effect of group sizes. You want to have equal group in both the comparison group and the study group, or you want to have like one is to two. And if it is needed design effect, then you can put that. Or response rate, like we have discussed, or there's another one concept that is the continuity prediction. So if the sample size is less than 30, then this generally the statistical package they take 
Z distribution. But to make it as a T distribution, we apply continuity correction. So continuity correction should be applied whenever sample size is less. And by default, you can apply it to all the options. So now let's see some example. So this is one research question. What is the difference in the prevalence of migraine headaches between men and women in an urban population? So primary objective is to estimate and compare the prevalence of migraine headache among men and women in an urban setting. You can scan to see this uh, article. So if I go to this reference article. So I have used this article. XX and gender differences in migraine. And there I have seen like migraine global prevalence as 20.7% in women and 9.7% in men. This is the difference. So I I have taken that as a value. 20.7% and 9.7%. The desired power I have taken at 80%. Level of significance as 5%. Two-sided hypothesis. Group sizes I have kept it as equal. I'll take equal number of men and women. And response rate I'm expecting 95%. And I'll do the continuity correction. We'll see this. So 20.7 and 9.7. So I'll go back to the statulator. You can use statulator or risk care. So first I'll go with the statulator. In statulator, I have chosen this option of two independent proportion. I have clicked this two independent proportion. So expected proportion in the reference. If I take male as a reference or female. So it was 23 and 9. Let me see the value. 20 and 9.7. So you can take like 21 and 10 also. So here I will take as a 21. And here you can take as a 10. And then in options, you have to do the adjustment. 80% that is already there. If you want to change the power to 90, you can change it. Similarly, if you want to change the level of significance, like make it as 3% or 1%, you can do this. Two-sided hypothesis is already there. Group sizes are equal. So I will just update this. So this is the calculation is 184 in each arm. So total sample size will be 368. If you want to adjust it for the 90, uh, this continuity correction is by default it is clicked. So you can leave it as such. In a response rate, if you are expecting a response rate of 95%, you can make it as 95 and you can update it. So again calculate this. So your sample size will be 386. That will be your, you can just see this, 21%, 95% is this and 386 for a difference. Here they are not, they have not taken, sometimes what, this is the 95, 95% 95 response rate. Yes, this one. So 193 in each arm, that means total sample size is 386. Generally, don't go by this, uh, projected one because once you see this 193 you think that wow this is only 193 but just see the lower line it is 193 in each group that means total is 386 so that's the calculated sample size so again on decision on some uh, continuity correction i said that when it is very number of samples are less then generally we go for the continuity correction now you have to do the practice so one exercise, the research question is what is the difference in the prevalence of hypertension between young adults, male and female in a suburban community? So you have to estimate and compare the prevalence of hypertension in young adult men and women. I'll show the proportion. So it is 20.5% and 7.5%. You can see the article also. So all of you, please do this.
Yes, what is the calculated sample size? Are people there or doing it or should I do it? I think I think I'll do it. How to justify small sample sizes? It is basically we take less than 30 as small. 30 or more than 30, we take that we can apply continuity. Less than 30, definitely you should go for continuity correction. Okay, so should I do it or you guys are doing it? Because I cannot see any. Can you see? Uh, no response. Not you people are not doing. So 20.5 and 7.5. 112. You, now you can, I, I'll show you with this also. Risk L. So if you use risk scale also, you can use this cross-sectional study. So you can see the 5%. Here they write in terms of, again, error rate, ratio is 1 is to 1. P1 is point, what was the value? Let me see, 20.7. So 0.227. Okay, 207. And here is the... What is the value? So it will be like continuity correction 184, otherwise 166, 167 in each group. If you use this. So again, I said that with this, you can actually put the exact value. Whereas if you come to statulator, it will not be exact value. So this is one way. Now, if you have got the uh, odds ratio, so if you are comparing proportion in two groups, you can calculate odds ratio also. So generally in statulator, if you see, there's an option of odds ratio. So either you can use that odds ratio or if you want to use the risk calc, then you need con to convert this odds ratio into the proportion. So for that, this is the step. So if the P0 is the baseline probability in the reference group and OR is the odds ratio. So first you will convert the baseline probability into the odds. So this, this is the formula for converting the probability into odds P0 by 1 minus P0. Then Using this odds ratio and odds, you will calculate the newer odds and then you will calculate the probability. So if sample size comes too small or large by using formula, this means it is not feasible. So we are going with the sample size based on our experience. In such case, how to write or justify in thesis or paper? Yes, then you can write that uh, calculated sample size is large, but in this reference period, I can only take this much of sample. So be because of feasibility, I can take. So basically, in any, uh, uh, you know, meeting or any research presentation, generally from PGs, we expect that they should know what they are doing. If they know that they should take this much sample, but because of the lack of time, they can only take this much. That is well justified. Our aim is that you should know how to take the correct sample size. But again, if the time period is a constraint and if it is not feasible, you can write it and you can go ahead with a smaller sample. It is de definitely acceptable. Yes, def yes, resources, especially in the clinical setup when one investigation, if it is costs very high, so you can go with that. That's why we say that, uh, that, yes, you can write these feasibility issue, resources issue, uh, but these you will accept as a limitation because you know that you have done it on a small, smaller sample size. So you know the limitations of your study and that you should accept under the limitation section, right? 
then coming to exercise so we have given one exercise what is the prevalence of diabetes 2 among individual in a suburb population so the researcher surveyed the 2000 participants and classified them based on their diet into two groups those consuming a high sugar diet and those consuming a low sugar diet so uh, this uh, the study found out that the individual with a high sugar diet had an odds ratio of 2.5 for having type 2 diabetes compared to those with a low sugar diet the baseline prevalence was 10%. So how to calculate? Either you can use the 10% uh, as a baseline prevalence and odds ratio of 2.5 and you have to calculate the proportion of diabetes in the second group. So these are the calculation steps. It is just the you know applying formula. And you can get the, in the new odds or the new uh, probability will be 0.217. So here the expected proportion is 10% in the low sugar diet and expected proportion in type 2 diabetes is the 80%. This is the 2.5. The desired part is 80%, 5% is the level of significance. Alternate hypothesis is two-sided and group size is equal. So if I have to calculate this, it is the 10% or 22%. So let me write it. It's the 10% and 22% or I have to use the 2.5 as a so I'll go as a, again to the statulator here you can see in the reference group I will reset this so expected proportion in the reference group is 10% so I have selected as 10% in the other group it is 22% so I have either you can use the 22% and calculate if you use this and calculate your sample size will be 159 in each arm. But if I want to use the measure of association, which is the odds ratio. In measure of association, either, either you can use this or you can select odds ratio. So the odds ratio, I have calculated it, it as a 2.5. So again, if you calculate this, then your study is, it will be a 165 in each arm. Taking a odds ratio of 2.5. So you can use either the odds ratio or the proportion to or difference in proportion. If you see this, here you can use the difference in proportions or odds ratio or relative risk. And here will be the proportion in the first group. But if you want to use the this risk scale, here you have to convert it in P2 because here you don't have an option of odds ratio. So if you want to use this, then you need to do this, this much. So from odds, from probability, you have to calculate odds. And from odds, you have to use the odds for other group and then calculate probability based on that particular odds. Now coming to the sample size calculation estimating single mean. So this is the formula for calculation size, sample size using single mean. It is the Z square S square by D square. So this is the value of Z at assumed level of confidence, which is again 95% and the value of Z is 1.96. S is the expected standard deviation and D is the margin of error, which is also known as the clinically expected variation. So what all input do we need if we are going for a single mean calculation? So we go for a level of confidence, which is 95%, expected standard deviation and margin of error. These three are must. And then depending on our need, if you want to correct it with population size or design effect or t-distribution, you can apply this. So the t-distribution and z-distribution in calculation of single mean or mean difference, these are the difference between the two. We will share the slide. I'm not going into the detail of difference between this z-distribution and t-distribution. Again, like you said here, here in this case, regarding the sample size, we have discussed this that uh, samples in case of a sample size if it is large as per central limit theorem you have to you can go with the z distribution if it is small like less than 30 you have to go for the t distribution so now let's understand the level of confidence in context of mean in this case you see that there are 2000 individual in this picture what you can see that there are Let's say there are 2,000 people and we wish to estimate the mean systolic blood pressure of this group. So at 95% level of confidence, 
I have calculated the sample size as 40. So this, what I will see that out of this, I have taken 200 people and the mean BP of these people are 112 with a standard deviation of 5. So what I will say that the lower limit is 18 and the upper limit is 117. Similarly, at 95% confidence level, if I withdraw 100 sample of the same size 40 and calculate the 95% uh, value, then I can say that the 95% of the sample will have the mean SBP value between the 108 and 170. And this we have discussed in the proportion also. Like the, we say that the true population mean in 95% of those sample, we are 95% confident that the true population mean will lie between these two values. So how to get the expected standard deviation? So for this, we have got the following options. Again, like we did it for the proportion, you have to do the thorough literature search and try to find out this value. And this value, like I said, it is not always you will see in the text or abstract. It may be available in the table. So if not available, you should do a pilot study on around 10 case to get expanded, uh, expected standard deviation. And if 95% range is available, like many times you see that 95% uh, like confidence interval is there, then you can calculate the expanded, expected standard deviation. You divide this range by 4. Because 95% means it is plus minus 2 standard deviation. So we say that plus minus 2 standard deviation contains 95% of the values. So if you like take 2 this side and 2 this side, so it is total of 4. So if you divide the range of this expected uh, range by 4, you get an expected value. So this 95% range if you divide this means you what you do highest minus lowest that will give you a range and divide that with the value of 4. This will give you expected standard deviation. You can do if you have got the 99 like uh, in this case in this example you can see that 95% CI for blood sugar level of a patient group is 80 to 120. Then the expected standard deviation is 120 minus 80 by 4. That is the 10. Similarly, if the minimum and maximum range is available, then also you can have this uh, maximum minus minimum divided by 6. Because 99, if the values are within plus minus 3 standard deviation, it contains the 99.7% of the value. So this again, the same concept, plus 3 this side and minus 3 this side, total of 6. So this range, if you divide it by 6, it also gives you the value of the standard deviation. So there are some useful tips for calculation of standard deviation because we use for, we have often find difficulty uh, in the students calculating this standard deviation. Like in this example, if maximum and minimum value of blood sugar level in a normal distributed population is 40 and 160, then your expected standard deviation will be difference of these two divided by 6 which, which will be 20. And if you are like estimating a sample size for a Likert type of parameters, let's say pain score on a 10 point VAS scale, then again minimum value is 0 and maximum value is 10. So your expected standard deviation will be 1.66. So for a measurement of scale, if you know the minimum and ma maximum value, you can have a expected standard deviation. So let's do some calculation. So the research question is, what is the average turnaround time for the patients in the emergency department for from arrival to final disposition? And what are the factors which contribute to these delays? So my primary objective is to estimate the average turnaround time of patients from their arrival to final disposition in the emergency department. This is the reference article. If I see this reference article, then I can see the turnaround time. So this is one study. I'll go down. And this, the overall average length of stay was two hours, 53 minutes, and four seconds, or one seven, and 173 minutes. 
this is this was the finding which i took and i have to calculate the standard deviation also so i said that standard deviation it is calculated from the you can see here the overall average length of stay was 2 hour 53 or 1 this thing plus minus 144 to 8 or 105 minutes so you have to see the text also sometimes tables also to see for expected or the standard deviation. So I have taken this value, level of confidence as 95% and expected because here the mean value is not there. If you see in the calculation, the calculation of the sample size is entirely dependent on the expected standard deviation. So it was 105 minute. Now how to decide about the margin of precision? Because here you don't have a percent. Like in case of a proportion, what we used to do, we used to take 5% as maybe absolute margin of error. And in case of a relative, we used to take from 5 to 20%. But here you have to take from your clinical judgment. So let's say I am, I expect that 30% should be my margin of error. So now let's calculate the sample size. So the value is 105 minute is the expected standard deviation and 30 minute is the Sorry, one zero, yeah, is the margin of error. So coming to your statulator, if I go to statulator, I can select the sample size calculation from single mean. Estimating a mean. This is a 95% level of confidence. Expected standard deviation is 105. So here you can type. And margin of error I have taken as 30 minutes. And then you can calculate the sample size. So it is 51. Again, if you want to adjust, you can adjust it for two T distribution or finite population or clustering the way we have discussed with the proportion. Now coming to the another example. So the, there are some like I have, uh, we have discussed that how to decide for this precision. So there's no specific rule. What do you think as a clinically or practically meaningful margin that you can select? So we are leaving this time to practice. Now coming to the calculation of two means. So this is the sample size formula for calculation of two mean. Here you will see it is multiplied by two because there are two arms. This is Z1 minus alpha, Z1 minus beta. This sigma is your standard deviation, full standard deviation. And this delta square is the difference of mean that the study aims to detect. So this sigma is the pool. Remember, it is the pool standard deviation. So formula for pool standard deviation is this much. N1 minus 1 square. This is the sigma 1 square plus N2 minus 1 sigma 2 square by N1 plus N2 minus 2 under root. These are the standard deviations of the first and second group respectively. When the sample size of N1 and N2 are equal in both the R, this formula may be simplified as SD1 square plus SD2 square by 2 under root. So what input do we need for comparing two proportions? So we see mean in the reference group. We look for the mean in the test group. And if there are difference in mean, that is also okay. Then we should have the pooled standard deviation. And the, because standard deviation of one group will be different from the other group. So using that formula, you should calculate the pooled standard deviation. The desired power is usually kept as 80% and level of significance is usually kept as 95%. And the others are like one-sided or two-sided hypothesis, equal group sizes or unequal group sizes, or design effect or T distribution if it is applicable. So coming to this research question, the question is, is there a significant difference in perceived stress level between nurses working in medical ICU and those in surgical ICU at a tertiary care hospital. So my objective was to compare the mean PSS score 
between nurses in the medical ICU and the surgical ICU using the PSS 10 scale. So if I go to see the reference article, you can see this is the reference article which I have used. In this case, you can see that here the hospital is the, uh, again it is an ICU, tertiary hospital at an ICU, but it is a cardiac ICU. But if you don't find exactly same study, you can have a nearly same study. So if I see this, they have written like stress in the past month, it is 87% mean SD score for nurses. Level of stress compared to, sur to surgical ICU is 18.18 with the SD of 3.88 and 6.17 with the SD of 3.21. So this, I have taken it as a 5 and 3.5. Desired power I have taken as 90. I have increased the power because with less power, the sample size comes very less. The level of significance has 5. Alternate hypothesis 2-sided and group size equal. So if I see this, and I have to calculate the pool standard deviation also. It is 3.5. But they have given, you can calculate it seeing the number of. So here, if I see this, I'll go to the statulator. So here the sample size, I will reset this, use the formula of sample size calculation comparing two independent means. The mean difference I have assumed between the two was expected difference between the mean. So I have used the expected difference as 5 and pool standard deviation is 3.5. If you go to the other if you calculate this, this comes as 8. That's why I've gone into this option and changed this to 90 because then it was very less. Generally, with mean difference, you will see that the sample size calculation is very less. So if you update this, this comes as 11 in tw like tw total of 22. But you will see that generally with uh, sample size calculation using mean, you have got a less sample size. So now this is one more question for you people. So do you want to practice? There's a, is there any significant difference? We'll, we'll do this. Any significant difference in the serum cytokine level between patients with the rheumatoid arthritis and healthy control in hospital setting. So the primary objective is to compare the mean serum cytokine levels, especially, especially the tumor necrosis factor and interleukin between the patients with rheumatoid arthritis and healthy individual. So again, this is the same problem. What to do if the study directly related to your research question is not available? In such case, you can closely take uh, uh, other variable. Like I have taken here the cases on rheumatoid arthritis with cytokine levels. And this was the serum cytokine level in herniated disc patients. If this was the other study. So if you see the... This article, this was in the low back pain, serum cytokine level. So if you come down, this is the table. If you see this table three, we have taken this table, this one. So this is the like level of interleukin six. You can see in the group one and group two, the value of standard deviation, it is 3 in this case and it is 0.4 in this case. So, and you see the sample size, 23 in one group and the 20, 10 in another group. So, we have calculated the pool standard deviation using this formula. And then, this pooled was 2.5. So, now, many times you have to calculate this pool standard deviation because that estimate is not directly available in the, from your reference article. And then you can put this in the as an input. So we will see. Input is mean difference is 3. 
and standard deviation is 2.5. So we'll go to this statulator. I'll show with the, the other one also. So statulator, I will reset this. So mean difference between the two is 5 and expected pool standard deviation is 2.5. Okay. If it is 3, like Dr. Samshad is saying 3, okay, I'll set it as 3 and calculate. This is 11 again. You have to go with 90% because I said that with 80% it comes very less. So you can increase the path. And uh, you can update this. So it comes as 15. That means 30, total of 30. If you go with this, again here it is proportion. So come to as a continuous outcome. It is the mean. So again, 5% and 80% ratio is okay. Here you have to give the difference. Here the value is not there. So it's better that you go with the statulator. So there are some limitations of this uh, risk scale. And usually you will find that statulator has tried to have all the options. So that's how we calculate the uh, sample size for difference in two mean. Now coming to one more formula which is the taro yamen formula. So many times you will see when you don't have a proportion available with you. Because if you see the taro yamen formula, it is the, in the numerator, it is the capital N. So capital N is the population size which you have. And in denominator, it is 1 plus N E square, where E is the margin of error. So you calculate, you only fix the margin of error and you have the reference population and you calculate the sample size. So generally, this is calculated using the 50% prevalence because if you take 50% as prevalence, it gives you the maximum sample size. So this formula is based on taking the maximum variance into account. That's why when you don't have a proportion available with you, you can use this taro yamen formula for the calculation of sample size in case of a cross-sectional study. So if you don't have a prior knowledge of proportion of interest, you can use this formula. So this is one example. A hospital administrator wants to evaluate the patient satisfaction. The record has shown that the emergency department served 2,000 patients. So you can calculate this at 95% level, which corresponds to a margin of error of 5%. So this is calculation, you can see n by 1 plus n into e square. So 2000 divided by 1 plus 2000 into 0 0.05. And then you have to use this, uh, calculate the final sample size, which comes as 200 by 6, which is 333. So these are some reference table for you. Value of z for alpha and bar, in case you, if you want. So stay connected and uh, the PowerPoint and the recording will be available to you people. Regarding certificate, yes, Clarnet, uh, generally we have seen that participants mailing to us and there's a delay in issuing certificate. Can something be done? Yeah, yes, ma'am. Sorry for the inconvenience, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, I will definitely... Uh... Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you are audible. Okay. So, ma'am, I will inform uh, to Vishudi regarding the same as she is the coordinator of the session. Yeah, like participant is asking how to get the certificate. Okay, ma'am. Uh, can you... So, uh, like, can you give some, some timeline, like, by which time... They will get it. Uh, definitely, ma'am. But before that, I have to talk to with the coordinator. Okay, okay. So okay. you if you could communicate with those participants regarding the timeline of getting the certificate and how they will get the certificate, both mode and timeline, okay. that sure. will be useful. Sure, ma'am. So over to you, Omita. Okay. So, um, we are done from our end. So, thank you. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, so, thank you so much, everyone. And thanks to you, ma'am, for joining us today. So, now with all your permission, I'm closing the session now for today. Thank you so much. Thank you. ये कौन करने के लिए सर्वाइव करते हैं
हाँ प्रणाम सर क्या हुआ वो बैठे ना कल अभी ना सब स्ट्राइक चल रहा है सर वो डॉक्टरों का ना स्ट्राइक चल रहा है देखे पेपर में हाँ आज भी स्ट्राइक है तो अभी मत ही आइए सब ओपीडी ओपीडी सब सब बंद किया हुआ किसी को आने नहीं दे रहा है तो ठीक हो हम पूछ रहे थे नहीं जब नॉर्मल हो जाएगा तब आपको बताऊंगी ठीक 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 है सर बहुत अच्छा